In the end, after enough time had passed that I could look back almost objectively, it was just stupid. There is no other reason, just a person hastened to conclusions, did not check and did something unforgivable, believing that it was justified. Even when she realized her mistake, her pride dictated that she would rather hell freeze over than she would admit that she had anything to apologize for. I hope her pride keeps her warm at night and her ego prevents her from realizing who she is an empty, stupid woman who only cares about what's in it for her. Did it hurt? Hell yes. Was I angry? Furious beyond words. Did I survive this? Mostly. It still hurts when I see a family with small children and think it could be us, rocking a little girl while she squeals and laughs, or throwing a ball to a little boy, praising him when he catches it. But at the same time, I thank God, or karma, or just luck that this happened before we had children. I can't stand the thought of being a part-time dad. We were young, even now, three years later, I'm only 28, and she's 26. We got married when she was 21, and I had just turned 23. We had dreams, a house, children, nice cars, everything we needed for a suburban utopia. Anita was not a stunning beauty, but she was very sweet. Reddish blonde hair, green eyes, 5 feet 7 inches, 115 pounds. Well distributed pounds. When she applied makeup, put on a little black dress and 4 inch heels, the guys lost track and stopped looking where they were going. Everyone said I was beautiful, in my own way. I was never handsome, but I was quite normal. Six foot two, 200 pounds, almost no fat. Pretty good muscles from work and the gym, light brown hair worn long and gray eyes. We were a beautiful couple. We were also rednecks in every sense of the word. It was just the lifestyle we grew up with. We were strong in the family and despised promise breakers, especially when the promises included wedding vows. Most of our friends also got married young and were already starting to get divorced. Three divorces, mostly due to money and infidelity. We were lucky. I started working three days after leaving school at a new place that specializes in small car parts, mostly German. It paid well for someone with only a high school education, and I showed my gratitude by doing the best job I could. I studied every machine, took every hour of overtime I could get, even worked with mechanics until I could tune basic machines myself. I worked my way up to spending most of my time training new recruits. This attracted attention, especially after the shift supervisor caught the new employee with her cell phone, which was prohibited except during break time. She watched a short training video I made to help her understand her job better. She was playing it when he saw her. After she showed it to him, he checked on all the trainees and they all had their own files to refer to if they had any problems. I was called into the office where the plant director, the shift supervisor, and a woman from the HR department were waiting for me. Waiting for me to screw up, I waited for the ax to fall. So, bud, what do you have to say in your defense? Bonnie told us about your training video. You realize you broke company rules by using cell phones, right? What do you think we should do? I was scared, but then I got angry. My theory has always been that, when in doubt, you should attack. I don't care about anyone. I was just trying to make the company more productive. I think you should let me put the videos on my work computer so they can view them on company-approved equipment. You keep me constantly moving, teaching three or four people at a time, and it really helps them when I'm in another location. If you think this is a bad idea, you can fire me right away. They were a little taken aback that I went on the attack. They just wanted to tug at me a little before offering the same thing. When everyone calmed down, I was given a dollar increase per hour and appointed training coordinator. Nita was delighted. She worked full-time and took part-time classes at a local college while earning her registered nurse degree. If she had taken a full course load, she could have graduated in a year. We discussed it, and she went part-time to focus on her studies. I took on even more overtime, but a year later, me, both sets of parents, all of our siblings and friends were sitting in the audience as she walked across the stage. She was the first in both families to have a university degree. Even though I was a coach, I was still on the third shift. 
This allowed me to come in early to coach the second shift and stay after to work the first. Plus, it maximized my time with my beloved. Nita had her eye on a few entry-level positions, but the pay was low. She was told more than once that after a couple of years of experience, her salary would increase. She talked to a few girls at both places and found that they usually quit after about two years to hire someone cheaper. One day, a friend had an accident, and we took her to the emergency room. They were overworked and severely understaffed. Nita finally asked the nurse, when she was free, why there were so few people on duty. We can't find anyone who would agree to work night shifts, especially on weekends. It's a shame. The pay is just great. Her application was accepted, she was interviewed, and two weeks later, she became one of the third shift nurses on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And the nurse was right. The money was very good for a beginner. She was scheduled to work 30 hours a week, but soon began working 40 or more. Between that and my job, money flowed in like a river. We decided not to change our lifestyle and saved money. Our mobile home and four acres were getting closer. A year has passed. We have learned to plan our time to be together as much as possible. We usually ate breakfast together, unless I had to stay overtime to work, and time in the bedroom was as wonderful as ever. We managed to sleep at least part of every day together. Life was good. Then I came across something that could make our lives much better. I had a friend, one of my closest friends, who was of Mexican descent and moved to the country when he was six. He was a little behind in school, and Billy and I started helping him since we all lived within sight of each other. He still had trouble with some words, which is how he got his nickname. We were on the school baseball team. I was third base, he was catcher, and Billy was playing first. One guy hit to right field with the bases loaded, and the outfielder made an outstanding catch, throwing the ball to Billy, who passed it to me, throwing it so hard it almost knocked off my glove. I made an out and threw the ball to Juan, who blocked home base and caught the guy. A triple out, very rare in sports. Juan screamed, trying to say yippee, but it came out as zippy, which brought us to tears and gave him his nickname. Despite his Spanish heritage, he was a true redneck, down to the beat-up baseball cap and redman chewing tobacco. He even had a Confederate flag tattooed on his bicep. He was a good guy, worked hard, helped his parents with bills because he still lived at home. He didn't drink much, was well-mannered, and had only one passion. His hobby, his passion is carp fishing. Carp fishing, in my opinion, is proof that people will find a way to bet on everything. You go to a stocked pond, pay an entrance fee, and catch fish. Carp are almost inedible, but the point is to catch whoever wins the hourly jackpot, the 24-hour jackpot, and the holy grail of carp fishing the weight fish. A weighted fish is a fish of a certain weight for a given pond, chosen at random when the jackpot is triggered. You pay per hour to stay in the game as you fish, and if you're lucky enough to catch, say, an 11-pound, 10-ounce fish, a certain weight, you win the jackpot. Jackpots accumulate over weeks and even months until someone wins. There are often hundreds, even more than a thousand dollars in the bank. It sounds expensive, and it is if you participate in all the bets. They even had an hourly rate for the smallest carp, and you could spend a hundred bucks or more in one night. It was too expensive for me as I was trying to save up for a house, but he was single, made good money, and loved it. He even won sometimes, but I'm sure if everything was calculated, he would be at a serious disadvantage. Every serious carp angler had his own special bait, and Zippy was no exception mixing mixtures until the smell made his mother banish his efforts from the kitchen. He had just won a big jackpot, so he bought a small ready-made building that Billy and I helped install. We even helped with mixing it sometimes if we could stand the smell. The rotten chicken mixture still makes me gag. Billy trained to become a pharmacist so he could take over his father's pharmacy when he retired. We were sitting around one day and Zippy started talking about his latest bait mixture, and how terrible it was. Billy started talking about how different compounds interacted with each other and quickly left us both in the dust. What I'm saying, guys, is if we can find the perfect synergy with the perfect ingredients, the one thing that attracts the fish, 
we can make a ton of money. We thought about it a bit and decided to give it a try. Most of our experiments were disastrous failures at first. I secretly suspect that the first few batches we came up with sent the fish to the other side of the pond. I studied carp as much as I could by browsing the internet while Nita worked. There was a surprising amount of information. I learned that they are scavengers but are attracted to heat, which I mentioned to the guys the next time we met. Billy smiled, and the next week he brought the chemical from the pharmacy, a liquid that could be bought without a prescription. It interacted with compounds in the dough, heating it. We tried this the next week with mixed results. The first few times he caught fish quite regularly, but then the dough began to melt and the fish would get the bait, but not the hook. He still won three jackpots that night, the biggest catch of the hour and the night, and a weight fish. It was a very good win, almost $700. The bait worked well enough to get him noticed, so he began rotating ponds, trying not to fish the same spot more than once every three weeks. The owners didn't like it when you won too much. Other fishermen saw you and went elsewhere. Zippy's mom helped us figure out how to keep the bait on the line. She didn't come into the bait shop, but she and her husband sat with us in their backyard one night, listening to us complain. Mom laughed, whispered something in Spanish to his father, and went into the house. I'm giving this to you as an experiment. If it works, buy your own. It was a pair of tights with a small crease. She saved them to store garlic and onions from her garden, tying a knot between each head, a very efficient storage system. It worked. The bait stayed mostly in the small pantyhose ball, but gave in easily when the carp bit. Once the carp was unhooked, Zippy would apply fresh bait and start again. It was still a matter of luck. I suggested adding chicken livers to the mixture. Billy suggested coffee grounds, something to do with chemical balance. Zippy suggested using yellow grains to tie everything together. Our chances have increased significantly with the additions. Then, like most great discoveries, we perfected the mixture by accident. Billy was helping his parents clean out the shed, and his mother gave him a bag full of old cosmetics and perfume to throw at the landfill. He had a bait bucket on the back of his truck, and no one knows exactly how, but some perfume got onto the mesh lid of his bait bucket. He kept it in an old refrigerator to keep it together, then put it in a bucket with a mesh lid to warm it up before using it. He drove straight from the landfill to the carp pond. Sighing, he tried to mix as much perfume as possible to dispel the smell. The fish went crazy. Catching carp is a matter of luck. You can get two bites in a row at the start of the night. And yes, it was a night activity because carp don't bite as well in the heat of the day and then not get another strike for the rest of the night. But this time he got five bites in 45 minutes and won the hourly jackpot. He went on to win two more jackpots throughout the night, plus a 24-hour prize for the biggest fish. The owners started looking at him, so he turned up his fishing rods and left. He was almost screaming when he called us the next morning. We met in the barn, and he explained what happened to the spirits. We checked online, and the perfume was still on sale at a reasonable price. We made another batch, guessing at the number of spirits, and Zippy went to another pond at the other end of the county, and the results were the same. He won three of the four hourly jackpots and walked away smartly. We had a council of war. I found a map of all the carp ponds in seven counties, surprised that there were 51. Zippy gave us a quick lesson by taking us to the pond in the middle of the day when no one was there. Billy and I each bought a pair of classic Zebco 33 reels on five and a half foot rods, since they were only allowed to have two rods in the water at a time. It was a good, versatile piece of equipment, and was nothing like the expensive equipment that many people used. Plus, it was a good cover, making us look like a couple of good guys who didn't know what they were doing. Which, to Billy and me, was pretty true. We decided right away not to be on the same pond at the same time and to fish once and move on, not returning for at least a month. The last thing we wanted was to set a pattern or become too famous. The first night I went, I probably gave the others entertainment because I seemed to be doing everything wrong. However, after seven hours I had won four hourly jackpots, three for the biggest catch and one for the smallest. 
almost $600, not bad for seven hours. Everyone congratulated me and chalked it up to rookie luck. Billy didn't do so well, but still won 400 and Zippy won five. Almost 1,500 in cash, not bad for night work. We put everything together in a coffee can in the shed. Four weeks later, we had 6,300 and the jar was starting to fill up. We all agreed to wait until the end of the fishing season and split the money. We hit our bait, too, by putting it in buckets of commercial carp bait after throwing away the original. You smell like you were in a junkyard with a cheap bitch, Nita told me one morning when I returned late. She was well aware of our experiments because I told her everything. I laughed and went into the shower, staying there until I washed off all the smell. I put on my boxers and went to the kitchen. Nita was sitting on the table, naked, looking at me with half-lowered eyes. Come have some breakfast, big boy. God, I didn't need to tell you twice. It was probably the most intense sex I've ever had. I think I passed out when I finally got free because I came to when she was trying to pull me out. Sorry, honey, I said, standing on shaky legs. You will kill me one day. It took us an hour to get out of bed and 45 minutes to shower together. Dying from hunger, we ordered two pizzas and ate one and part of the other. Life was wonderful. Then we became greedy. The weather started to cool down and most places closed for a few months, starting up again when it warmed up. We decided to grab everything we could while we could. We fished Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. We didn't notice, but we were being watched. Many pond owners communicate with each other, and Billy and I have become famous for our beginner's luck. Zippy also attracted a lot of attention. The Mexicans stood out among the crowd of pale, fat rednecks, especially someone who regularly beats them. Things at home were also getting a little tense by then. Nita began to resent the fact that I spent so much time away from her. I never told her how much I made per week, wanting to surprise her with a ton of money when the season was over and tell her to start looking for a house. I talked to Billy and Zip, and we decided to take a week off. Billy's wife also began to complain. We were still experimenting with the bait, trying different perfumes mostly, so I would often come home smelling like a new scent. I found out later that everything fell apart when Nita went to Walmart to do our weekly shopping and ran into a friend who was the cashier at the line she was using. They discussed friends and families, then Jane surprised Nita by leaning over and inhaling. What was it? Just checking to see what brand you're wearing today. Bud was here yesterday for his weekly shopping. I swear, between the perfume and the tights and the condoms, it's a wonder you can walk at all. I'd love to be a fly on your wall some night. Nita didn't know what to say, so she just smiled and nodded. I told her we had found a way to keep the dough on the hook, but didn't go into detail. When she returned home, she turned the whole house over looking for my stash, not knowing that everything was in the bait shop. Condoms came into play by accident. Zippy took the wrong bucket and didn't realize it until he got to the pond so he called Billy in a panic because he lived near their house, asking him to take an extra bucket before he went to the pond where he was going to fish. Billy left the bait, and that's when they discovered they didn't take the tights. Zippy almost gave up in annoyance when Billy smiled. He went back to his truck and took out the packaging. It was a pack of six condoms. You're here, you can try, Billy said with a smile. It took three to get it right, tying it tightly to the hook and making small slits along the sides. To their surprise, it worked very well, lasting longer than the tights. We each started keeping a pair of pantyhose and a dozen condoms in the glove compartment of our trucks. Nita, in full jealous mode, searched the house before I got home and then waited until I fell asleep to check the truck. I have to wonder, looking back, how she felt when she opened the glove compartment and found two pairs of pantyhose and a package of condoms with two missing. It didn't help that both pairs were worn by Billy's wife. She gave us several pairs when they tore on her. Nita could tell they were worn. My girlfriend has always had a hot temperament and she fought to control it constantly. But on this day, she released the demons. I woke up to a car with four flat tires and a missing rear mirror. I found my fishing rods in the driveway, clearly run over by her car,
the reels flattened. She left me a note on the bathroom mirror, written in lipstick. You bastard. Go fishing, of course. Just so you know, two can play this game, you bastard. I called her mother. I called her friends. I called the hospital. No one saw her, but one friend said she called. What did she say? Nothing I would repeat. My advice is, if what she said is true, you better run. And if it's not true, you need to find her quickly. It didn't help my mood. I tried calling her until I went to work, using the truck I borrowed and calling her during breaks. At four in the morning, I said screw it and told the shift manager I was leaving. He seemed to think it was a good idea. You've been out of sorts all night. I hope whatever's bothering you isn't contagious. I stopped at Walmart on the way home and bought two new classic 33 reels and two ugly Styx rods, very durable rods that bend all the way and never break. I still needed to fish this weekend if I could appease Nita. Maybe a story about money would help. Maybe I could even convince her to come with me and see how I spend my nights while she works. Maybe this will calm her fears. I noticed a car, but people always park in the wrong place when visiting someone in one of the apartments. It stood out, however, as a BMW among all the compact cars and old trucks. I was just happy to see Nita's car. I took my bags in one hand and my fishing rods in the other, balancing as I opened the door, finally letting go of the bags and turning the key. The door opened about halfway and even a deaf person could hear them. Now, a reasonable person would figure out what's going on before reacting. A thinking person would gather the evidence and burn this bitch to the ground. A coward would simply turn around and leave, or quietly come in to take a look. The redneck would simply clean his face. I have never been known for my intelligence or intelligence. The last person to call me a coward wears a prosthetic to remind him every day that it wasn't the best idea he ever had. I was a redneck, and rednecks are violent. I kicked down the bedroom door, catching my loving wife and some bastard in bed. She turned pale, then blushed. How does it feel, bastard? It sucks to be betrayed, right? And now you. That's all she had time to say when I hit her so hard that she flew off the bed. I recognized the guy, one of the doctors in the emergency department and a famous ladies' man. She once told me that she couldn't stand him, that he had ruined two marriages, and that management had warned him to stay away from married women. Looks like he wasn't listening. He jumped up, deciding to bluff. He was a regular at the gym and loved to show off his black belt. Calm down, dude. She came towards me. Is it my fault that you can't satisfy her? I'll pack my things and leave. Looks like the fun is over for today. Get out of the way now and you won't get hurt. Save some dignity and move away. In my anger, I forgot that I was still holding the fishing rods in my hand. One night on the pond, I saw a guy trying to catch a monster. His friend was helping him when the line broke and the rod snapped back. She hit his friend right on the cheek, and the mark remained there until the end of the summer. People involved in causing pain should pay attention to the fishing rod. They will probably throw away all their whips. He never expected this, who uses a fishing rod as a weapon. I was either good or lucky because the first blow landed right on the end of his dick. He let out a high-pitched scream as the rod struck and tried to cover his family jewels so that the next blow landed on his fingers. I gave him two good hits when I heard the trigger go off. Bad. Stop right this minute, or I swear to God I'll shoot you. You have no right to act like that after what you did. She was holding my Colt Python, the same gun Rick carries in The Walking Dead, and it contained .357 ammo. My anger evaporated. So not only do you have someone in our house, on our bed, now you're threatening me with a gun? I hope whatever happened was worth it because we're done. At first she looked uncertain. Then she made a threatening face. I'll tell you when we're done. It was just a little punishment, but if you don't listen, it'll happen more often. Now move away and let him go. Be happy that I'm not asking you to apologize. I looked down at him trying to crawl out of the door, then up at her and grinned. Go to hell. Shoot. Her eyes widened, which was probably the last thing she expected to hear from me. 
I didn't hit the bastard again, but I did help him out the door by kicking him in the ass every time he tried to get up. I left the door open, and quite a large crowd gathered outside, attracted by shouts and screams. They quickly ran away when Nita fired. I didn't feel anything, and there was no blood, so she must have missed. Next time the bullet will be in your ass, she screamed, lowering the gun to point it at me again. I looked up, seeing a hole in the ceiling. It's good that all duplexes are one story. Some caring neighbors called the police when the screaming started, and they were just getting out of their car when she made the threat. Their guns were pointed, and they were hiding behind the car within seconds. It must have been a sight to behold. She was naked, now outside, holding this big gun. Her partner in crime tried to crawl out to his car, still naked, but when the shot rang out, he put his hands on his head, not knowing who was holding the gun, and started begging me not to kill him, apologizing for screwing my wife. I was fully dressed and just holding my hands up. I bet they watched months of CCTV footage of her. They were screaming at Nita, she was screaming at me, and the bastard was screaming that he was sorry and begging her not to shoot him. She hesitated, looking at the police and then at me. She pointed her hand at the cops and I grabbed it, knowing they were inches away from shooting her. She let go of the gun and I threw it towards the police, wrestling with her on the ground. We were handcuffed almost instantly. In the end, we all got a free ride to jail. I was accused of assaulting a doctor as well as domestic violence for hitting Nita. She was charged with assaulting a police officer with a weapon, making a threatening statement, indecent exposure, and shooting within city limits. If they could have found something, they would have charged the doctor as well, but in the end he was released. His wife had to come and pick him up, bring him clothes. She divorced him, named Nita in the complaint, and tried to sue the hospital, so everything became public knowledge. I promised not to charge her for threatening my life with a gun if she agreed to drop the assault charge. She agreed reluctantly, not wanting more public attention. The doctor could have made my life very unpleasant, but he realized what awaited him and left in an unknown direction. It took his wife almost a year to find him working in a clinic abroad. She already had almost all of their assets, but he had to pay alimony, including for the past period. Overall, I dodged a bullet and this was not an intentional pun. The prosecutor decided that he did not want to be the manager of this circus and let us go. But Nita had to take an anger management course and do 200 hours of community service for pointing a gun at police officers. Zip and Billy came to bail me out using some of our fishing money. I refused to pay for Nita and her parents had to come and pick her up. This gave me time to return home, pick up most of my things and leave town. I haven't heard from Nita for three weeks. I think she was waiting for my apology. When that didn't happen, she called me full of sarcasm and told me to come home. As kind as this invitation is, I think I'll refuse. Don't call me again, Nita. We're done. I don't know what wild idea you've got, but I've never cheated on you. Not once. I don't care what you heard, what you imagined, or what you thought. I could never trust you again, and I would have to sleep with one eye open if I returned. She knew she was doing badly when I called her Anita instead of Nita. Her tone immediately changed. Look, I may have made a mistake. Why don't you come home and we can discuss this like two adults? No. Wait, let me think about it. No. Wait while I seriously think about this. Okay, not just no, but hell no. I hung up and didn't answer calls again until the next day. I knew that she was supposed to receive the documents at 2 o'clock, and at 2.30 my phone rang. It was her, of course, and instead of demands and threats, she cried. I gently told her that I was sorry it had come to this, but I couldn't go back to her. I'm sorry, Nita, I really am. But I can't go back and I can't get over how easily you ruined our marriage, so this is the only way forward. Please don't fight it. She fought, put off everything as long as she could. Finally, the judge got tired. I never showed up to any meetings, I didn't see the point. Maybe I should have because the judge ordered marriage counseling. One session for each and ten joint ones. I insisted that if after counseling I still wanted a divorce, it would go through without any obstacles. 
Otherwise, I would have ignored the order and risked jail. I was called before the judge, and he listened to my reasons. He looked at me sadly, realizing that he was wasting everyone's time, but agreed and obliged Anita to do the same. She chose a consultant. He was a young man in his thirties. I had a question from the very beginning in our private meeting. How long have you been doing this? He didn't seem surprised and smiled. Longer than you think. This is my sixth year. Are you good at this? He didn't seem to expect this. He straightened out a little. Very good. One of the best. My reconciliation rate is one of the highest in the state. I frowned. What if I told you that I'm not here for reconciliation, that I'm only here because it looked like my only chance to get a divorce? If you think you can get me to reconcile with my wife, you'll find it difficult to do. The first suspicion is that you are not objective. The first suspicion is that you are promoting your agenda, not mine, and we are done with you. I also checked your record and was surprised to see four complaints, three from men and one from a woman, claiming that you are not interested in the real result, but only in your performance. Oh look, time is up. See you next Thursday at six o'clock sharp. He looked like a carp caught in a net, gasping for air. The first two sessions were quite difficult. He told us to sit together on the sofa, facing him. I chose a chair. I saw him trying to hide his frown. The first hour was mostly about her little mistake. It was like this for the second hour. When she started saying the same thing again, I pulled out the newspaper I had brought and started reading. Both looked at me in surprise. What are you doing? If I want to watch reruns, I'd watch old TV series. For two and a half hours, you let her talk and made no attempt to direct her attention. If that's what you want, please continue. I'll just sit quietly and read. He was angry. You could see it in his eyes and body language. Bad if you don't. I stopped him. We're not friends. Address me as Mr. Hart if you want to address me. I don't call you by your first name, do I? He was confused, and I wondered why. Didn't he listen to me? Sorry, Mr. Hart. I'm just trying to connect with you to make things easier. But you have to participate, or I'll inform the judge. I shrugged. Report. My lawyer has carefully checked the documents, and they say that I am required to attend. There is not a word in them that I am required to participate. So why don't you stop and focus on the real problem of how to prepare us for life after divorce? This effectively ended this session. Well, he did tell the judge who invited me to the meeting, saying that I should at least make a good faith effort. Let me be clear, I'm in no way saying that you should go back to her. It's your decision, and after the sessions I will accept whatever you decide. But you might want to listen to how things went wrong so quickly, it might help. You in future relationships. He was a pretty smart old man, which is probably why he was a judge. So I did my homework and was ready for the next session. I handed Anita and the consultant, Bob, a piece of paper. What is this? This is a record of all the times I've been fishing when she thought I might be doing something else. These guys keep pretty good records, so you'll see when I arrived and when I left, or at least, when I got my last win. And if you think I was having romantic affairs at the carp pond, you've clearly never been there. The smell is far from conducive to romance. I looked at her. Look, maybe I should have explained about condoms and pantyhose, but I didn't see the need. You were still half listening when I told you what I was doing. You had your own hobbies, going out with the girls, sometimes shopping. What? Something like this. Did I think you were cheating? No. I think you might dance too close sometimes, or let your hands wander where they shouldn't, but I trusted you. So I didn't check you, didn't look for you. Motel receipts. I didn't check your laundry to see if there was anything wrong. If I suspected something, I would have talked to you. Why couldn't you have done the same? We would still be together. Would be looking for a house and talking about children. Instead, we're here with a complete stranger, telling him all our secrets. At least you tell him the calmer I become, and when it comes down to it, it's no one's business. Except for the two of us, and I am very much outraged that we are even here. This was my longest statement in the sessions, 
and they were so stunned that it took them a minute to come to their senses. Then my phone rang. Oh, look, time's up. See you next week. I walked out the door and left before they could react. I felt it the next time we were there. Something has changed. Nita looked into my eyes, and she didn't cry. You spoke last week. Now it's my turn. I nodded. Looks like we may have made a little progress here. I realize that now there is no chance that we will be together again. I ruined it, and it cannot be fixed. I just want to tell you what I thought. You were the perfect husband. You hardly drank, you had a good job, and you didn't cheat on me. I was so proud of you. All the nurses at work, at least the younger ones, were either divorced or cheating. I was so lucky that we had the same schedule. Most of them were having affairs because the husbands took advantage of all this freedom on the weekends to have connections, and it was mostly revenge. I bragged about you so much. Then you started fishing. Suddenly you weren't home while I was working. At first I trusted you, but then you started fishing more. The time apart increased, and all my girlfriends said the same thing. He has a girlfriend. Then a week before everything fell apart, one of them told me that she saw you with another woman, and you were laughing and even hugging. I wanted to ask you then, but I was afraid of the answer. Then Jane told me about perfume, condoms, and pantyhose. What was I supposed to think? You know, I've always fought to control my temper, but this time I couldn't. My only thought was to cause you the same pain that you caused me. So I contacted Dr. Slime. He was available and willing. Even then, I never intended to tell you. It would have been my little secret when I thought about your cheating. Then you came home early and everything went to hell. You shouldn't have been there. You were never supposed to find out. I felt so ashamed until my anger took over. Only the shock of your blow calmed me down. Even when you were hitting the bastard with a fishing rod, I knew we were finished. I just took your revolver out of the nightstand to prevent his murder. I have to admit that my anger was still there, and my finger really wanted to pull the trigger. When you looked me in the eye and told me to pull the trigger, that was the moment I knew I no longer mattered to you. At that moment the anger began to go away. I was still confused when the police arrived. I even thought about shooting in their direction so that they would kill me and stop the pain. She stopped, wiped her eyes, and drank some water. I wanted to say something, but she stopped me. Then we all went to jail. My heart broke again when you refused to pay for me and left. Then the doctor's wife arrived and things got even worse. When she sued the hospital, everything came out. My friends, my family, everyone knew something had happened, but now they knew the details. It was a pretty lonely time for me. You left, my friends left, the management at the hospital was unhappy with me, but they left me because I was a great nurse, but the warm feeling from work was gone. So here we are. I screwed up, and even if I did everything to fix it, I know you. You are an Old Testament man, and I have always admired you for your beliefs. I made a decision. Sessions end today. I give up, bud. Before I could answer, she walked out the door and left. I looked at the consultant. Should I go get her? Only if you're worried about her hurting herself. Otherwise, I'd leave her alone. She's already started the healing process, I'd just leave her alone. We divorced. She was amazed at the amount I had saved for our house. She had a general idea, but she always trusted me so she didn't worry about it. I made sure she got half. Of course, we moved out of our old apartment a long time ago. The owners don't approve of someone shooting up their property. I rented a small studio closer to work, which suited me just fine. Nita moved in with another nurse, saying it was more economical, and she hated an empty house. Everyone encouraged me to start dating again, but I wasn't ready. I was hurt and hurt and yelled at several women until I realized I didn't like the direction I was going and asked for help. The consultant this time was a woman. I felt a little uncomfortable at first, but she calmed me down until I felt comfortable. So I told her about myself and Anita and how I behave towards women in general. I think maybe I'm turning into a miso. A miso, you know, one of those guys who hates women. She actually laughed. I don't think that's true. Otherwise, you would never have agreed to come to me. 
I'd be just another bitch trying to ruin your world. That's what I think. Even though you're divorced, you're still in love. I also think that you would like to get her back, but you can't, not right now. Your attitude towards women is just a result of your pain, but life will get better, and so will you. Too much of a gentleman to continue reacting to women like that. Soon you will realize that they did nothing to hurt you, and you will treat them accordingly. Anything else you want to talk about? I saw her six times. I learned that I don't always communicate the way I should, and that I'm still a little immature and selfish. I admitted all this and tried to correct it. She also strongly encouraged me to tell my future lover my story, including my shortcomings, and hope that she could come to terms with them. If she loves me, that will be enough. I've calmed down. Four months later, my boss called me into the office. There was a man there whom I had never seen who turned out to be the vice president. After introductions and a short conversation, he got down to business. We have 11 branches in this country, and this one has the best performance record. Being a discerning person, I did my research, and you were mentioned in every conversation. We have big problems with the Alabama plant, and I am not happy with the performance of our Kentucky plant. We want to offer you a position as a traveling trainer. We will send you to any of our branches that need help so that you can identify problems and make suggestions. Of course, there will be a significant increase in salary, housing and transportation will be paid, and there will even be bonuses associated with the speed of fixing the situation. This is a pilot program, and we're only offering this opportunity to two people. The other guy works in California and will handle everything on that side of the Mississippi, and you'll be in charge of everything on this side. Think about it. If you agree, we'll try. Four days later, I was on a plane flying to Alabama, where I was met by a man with a pickup truck. We drove to the short-term apartment complex that would be my home for the next 10 weeks. The mechanical and training parts of the work were easily completed and production immediately took off. I found the work environment to be poor, with managers not trusting their people or technical staff. The second shift manager was a real pain in the ass, questioning everything, ordering unnecessary changes, slowing down production, and then blaming the workers. Seven weeks later, the vice president who hired me called. I see that you are making progress. Great job. However, it is not as significant as I hoped. Are there any problems I need to know about? I hesitated, and he noticed it. Look, I didn't hire you to be a snitch. However, if anything is interfering with our effectiveness, you need to let me know whether it involves personnel or equipment. That's part of your responsibilities. And since you're now working directly for me, you're outside the normal chain of command, so there won't be any consequences, understand? Yes, sir. Okay, you need to make some changes, especially on the second shift. It's a hostile environment and production is suffering. Managers need to realize that they need to step back and stop micromanaging. If people know their jobs, there's no need to hover over them. Trust them and it will bear fruit. There was a moment of silence before he laughed. Well, I told you to tell the truth. Let's see what I can do. Two days later, the second shift supervisor was sent to my main plant for two weeks to oversee the operation. As part of a new cross-training experiment, to my surprise, I was appointed interim manager. Production increased 17% in the second week. I would like to say that the manager returned with a new attitude, but after a month he was the same again. I was sent back in the second month for three weeks to train a new manager. Then I went to Kentucky for six weeks. It was a pretty good venture, so it took a little time to improve. Word got around that I had my boss's ear and bad things happen to those who don't cooperate so it became much easier for me to complete my tasks. My bank account grew by leaps and bounds. When you pay for everything except food, there's not much to spend money on. I thought that in another year, I would start looking for a house seriously. The week I returned from Kentucky, Billy and Zippy called me for a business meeting. One of the results of the divorce was that we were banned from the local ponds, so Zippy had to travel to fish. Zip's mom, as usual, proposed. You can't make money fishing anymore. Why not try making money on bait? 
you won't have to sit by a stinking pond at night, just sit back and watch the money roll in. We named the bait after her as a sign of gratitude. We found a lawyer who Billy's father knew, defended the formula, and opened the business. The magic of Mama Rosita with her picture on the front of the packaging. She snorted when she saw this. This will be my chance at glory, my face on a bucket of stinking pile of crap. We started small, a few local bait shops, even a few carp ponds agreed to sell it. Business was slow at first, but picked up pace to the point where we couldn't cope. Our lawyer found us a bigger building, and we found mixers through bakery supply, huge things that could mix 200 pounds at a time. We bought corn grits, chicken livers, and perfume in bulk. Coffee grounds were more difficult until Billy came up with the idea of donating coffee to homeless shelters and kitchens for the poor in exchange for ground coffee. The other three ingredients were a closely guarded secret, mixed by Zippy in his old barn and delivered to our factory in unmarked bags. We worked two shifts and still couldn't cope with demand. When someone found out they were also good for catching catfish, our sales exploded. We knew we were successful when Walmart called us. We'd heard enough horror stories about working with them that when they told us we'd have to expand and produce five times as much product to fulfill their contract, we thanked them and politely declined, shocking them to their core. As a result, we signed a contract with one of the large sports stores for all our products for two years with a guaranteed order for three times our production. The contract included a three-month turnaround time so we found another building, purchased large mixers, and started working. The building housed 160 mixers capable of needing 500 pounds. It got so big that Zippy quit his job long ago and was now a manager. His mother also quit her job as an office manager at a law firm and now ran the business side for twice her previous salary. We were an LLC, Zippy owned a third, Billy owned a third, and I own 20% as a silent partner. Rosie's mom owned 10%. If it weren't for her, we wouldn't be here, and that guaranteed her a place in our business. A year and a half passed, and I was home for the first time in eight months, moving from one plant to another as needed. I even crossed the river while working on a site near Kansas City. I was well known around the company for my love of barbecue, even having t-shirts from various places I'd been. I loved the mustard-based sauce in Alabama, the spicy, thick tomato sauce with brown sugar in Kentucky. Each state had its own mixture, and in most cases, if you drove 30 miles in any direction, you could find another mixture that was the best in the world. I decided to go to my favorite place and put on my new Kansas City t-shirt. The owner almost kicked me out. I had to explain that it was a free t-shirt. And besides, everyone knows that his establishment is the best. This softened him enough that he allowed me to stay and eat, and he gave me a t-shirt, which I promised to wear the next time I was in another city, and sent me a photo. I saw her enter. Nita didn't notice me, and I was able to get a good look at her. She was thinner, and her hair was much shorter than I remembered. They were lighter, but it suited her. She always loved the sun. She was with two girls and another guy, and so that it wouldn't get awkward when she noticed me, I walked over after they sat down. She laughed, but the laughter disappeared when she looked at me. I wouldn't want to disturb you and your friends, Nita. I just didn't want it to get awkward when you saw me, so I decided to come over and say hello. The new style suits you, girl. Bon appetit. She touched her hair with a slight smile on her lips. Thanks, bud. You look good, too. Traveling sure does you good. Well, when you're away as often as I am, you have to choose whether to spend time in bars or at the gym, and I've never been much of a drinker. I'll let you eat in peace. And Nita, it was good to see you. Her eyes went wide when I used my pet name for her, and she nodded as I walked back to my desk. Three minutes later, someone loomed over me. It was her, holding her plate. Can I sit at your table? We were going to get takeout, but I think I want to stay a little longer. I stood up and pulled out the chair for her. We ate and talked. Real talk. She surprised me when she said she had quit her job at the hospital and taken a job in an office with regular hours. The pay was a little less, 
but she finally had the experience that everyone was asking for when she started, so she was good. She surprised me by saying that she has a therapist whom she meets with once a month to keep her anger issues under control and stay focused. I told her about my sessions, which surprised her. Finally, Nita asked the question that must have been bothering her ever since she saw me. Dating anyone? I laughed, which surprised her. Not seriously. It's hard to form a romantic relationship when you're on the road so much. I don't want to force someone into a part-time relationship. That wouldn't be fair. She smiled. Me too. At first, with my schedule, it was almost impossible to start dating other than the people I worked with, you know. She fell silent, a little embarrassed. I surprised her by taking her hand. You don't need to bring up bad memories. The past is the past, and we don't need to dwell on it. What about now? You have normal work hours, so there should be plenty of time. She was embarrassed to admit that she dated several men. Realistically, I didn't expect her to become a nun. She also added that she hasn't found anyone worth more than three dates. She changed the subject by asking about my t-shirt, so I spent the rest of the meal telling her about the wild places I'd visited and the strange things I'd eaten. The alligator BBQ wasn't too bad, the armadillo not so much. The ostrich was quite good, as was the Kentucky lamb. She made faces when I talked and giggled at my assessments. Finally, she looked at her watch. Damn, I'm late, I have to go. Thanks for spending time with me, bud. It was really good to see you. Before I had time to think, she leaned over and gave me a very nice kiss. Call me when you're in town, I won't mind at all. I looked down after she walked out the door, seeing the business card. It was her office, and the number was written on the back. I thought about it for a while before I put it in my wallet. We saw each other sometimes when I was at home. I think she would want us to get closer, but I just couldn't. She tolerated it for a while and then started dating another nurse from another office. I was still traveling, still going to the gym, but I had a new interest, online classes. I wanted to be more than just a traveling coach. When my boss found out about this, he arranged for the company to pay for the classes, calling it an investment. I had little college education, so I completed my business management degree in two and a half years. I received my diploma by mail, deeply aware of the pain of not having someone to share it with. Then my boss called me, telling me to come to the main office. He introduced me to my replacement. You did a great job, but I know how hard traveling is for a young man. Now that you have your degree, it's time to move on. The manager at your home plant is retiring, and the production manager is moving up the ranks. Suddenly, I have an opening on my management team, and you'd be perfect. You have four months before Jack retires, but I need an answer in two months so I can find someone else if you decide you want it. This is not interesting. One more thing to note. The production manager in the late 50s, so in the future, the manager's position will also be vacant, and you know how much I like to promote my own. Think about it, for now Jones will always travel with you. We need coaches. I thought about it and decided it would be good for me. I'm tired from the journey. It was fun for a while, but I loved the idea of waking up under the same roof every day. I almost fell in love. She was from Alabama, with bright red hair and a body much like my ex, only with much larger breasts. She was the production coordinator, and we worked together often when I was there. We started talking about hobbies, and she admitted that she loves fishing. She even had a boat. She said this with a grin, and I knew the story. Her husband, in addition to being a serial cheater, was an avid fisherman and owned a top-of-the-line ranger boat with all the bells and whistles. When she finally got over him and they divorced, she gave up other things to get his boat, wanting to hurt him as much as possible. The boat sat for a year before she finally decided to use it, and she immediately fell in love with fishing. She didn't like base fishing, she caught monster cats in a nearby lake. Her current record was 28 pounds. I casually asked what bait she was using. This was before we signed with a sporting goods store, so we were strictly local. The next time I visited, we agreed to go on her boat that weekend. I brought five pounds of our bait. 
Catfish fishing is very similar to carp fishing and is best at night. We started a couple of hours before sunset and just floated around the lake. Molly noticed me looking at a couple of girls on another boat and took off her shirt, revealing her amazing breasts in a very small bikini top. She laughed at my surprise. Think you can keep your eyes on the boat now? Definitely. We sailed to the mouth of the bay, one of her favorite fishing spots, anchored, cast our lines, and opened a beer. Forty minutes and three bottles of beer later, she got bored. The boat had very comfortable, large fishing chairs, and she climbed onto my lap and began to spin around, surprising me. I think we should use this opportunity to get to know each other better, don't we? I was in favor, but made a symbolic protest. What about the fish? Screw the fish. I've got the reel set. We'll know if there's a bite. One thing led to another, and soon she had no upper hand. I came up for air and asked her if the bikini bottom matched the top. Yes, I would show you, but I'm not wearing it. The only thing under these shorts is me. Do you want to see? Of course I did. She stood up, turning her back to me, and pulled down her shorts. Her ass was exactly as I had hoped, firm and full. She looked over her shoulder and grinned. You're overdressed. Then we had sex. We slowly sailed to the marina, famous for its scales. The boys almost rolled over when she showed them the fish she wanted to weigh. Eight fish, the largest weighed 69 pounds, a new lake record. They kept these fish in a special live well until the state sent someone to check. The marinas would attract a lot of attention as people came to fish over the next two days. Molly has been featured in local and state newspapers, a state wildlife magazine, and interviewed on television. I was mentioned as her fishing companion. When asked what kind of bait she used, she said it was a commercial bait that you can buy anywhere and would just let people guess which one it was. She really made up for the interruption on the boat, and on subsequent visits she made sure we rocked the boat before casting our lines. She was funny, sexually exciting, a good conversationalist, and simply easy on the eyes. I was almost ready to ask her for a more exclusive relationship when she cancelled the date and I saw her at a restaurant with another man. Their touches made it clear to everyone that they were not strangers to each other. I didn't see her all weekend and the next week at work, she took time off. The next month she was all over me and noticed how cold I had become. She sighed. You saw me, right? Yes, but don't worry, we didn't commit to each other. I'd rather hear it from you, but that's okay. Listen, I'm sorry. Brad is my steady boyfriend. He was overseas for almost a year on a contract and got an unexpected vacation. We'll get married eventually. He knows how much I love sex, and I know he can't do without it either, so we reached an agreement. Whatever we do, whoever we date, while we're not around, it's none of our business and no need to know. You were a great guy, bud, and you're almost as good as Brad at. Technique. I would like to continue dating you. His contract will not end for another eight months. I thanked her but declined, saying that while it didn't matter to him, it did to me, so we'd just remain friends. I wished her well, but never touched her again except when we were fishing, and I helped her catch those monsters she kept pulling out. The guys on the water were watching her, trying to figure out how she caught the monsters, but they didn't even get a bite. They even went so far as to search her boat, but she kept the bait locked away in a small refrigerator in her father's garage. She ended up breaking her own state record by catching a 77-pound monster. She sent me a photo of a fish, and it was taller than her. A guy stood nearby, smiling. Brad, I guess. They looked happy. She continued her good fortune, winning several tournaments until the bait became available in local stores, and she lost her monopoly position. When I returned home, I no longer needed to wander. I took some of my money and bought a nice house in the village, on eight acres of land. There was even a decent-sized pond on the site. The house came with a small tractor and some equipment, so I kept the fields tidy and planted a small vegetable garden. I still went on dates, and was a pretty eligible bachelor for our area. He slept with whoever he wanted, but did not find anyone with whom he could spend the rest of his life. 
Everything changed when I came home one day and saw someone sitting on my porch. Or rather, two people. I was surprised to see Anita and a little girl of about eight who looked remarkably like Anita. Hi, she said, getting up from the porch swing. I like your house, as far as I can see. I came to ask for a favor. Not for myself, but for Annie. She wants to learn how to fish, and I can't think of anyone better than you to do that. Please. She looked at me with puppy dog eyes, and I was surprised at how much it affected me. Annie just watched, hoping for the best. I noticed that even when she smiled, there was sadness in her eyes, and I wondered what that meant. Well, what could I have lost? Did she bring her fishing rod? Anita almost broke her face from smiling. No, we didn't know what to take. Are you sure you have something suitable here? I ended up looking like a pack mule by the time we got ready to go fishing. We needed chairs, a cooler for drinks, and, of course, rods and reels. I gave Annie one of my trusty fishing rods. It was small enough for her to handle. I first set up a fairly heavy weight and had her cast the line across the field until she figured out how it worked. She looked so serious it was almost funny. Then I baited the hook with one of the worms we dug up in the garden, set up a float, and showed him where to cast. There was a lot of drag in the pond, so I knew she would catch something eventually. Anita rocked on the chair I brought, smiled, and sipped iced tea. She had that look that I still recognized, and I wondered what her plan was. She was 28, just entering her prime, and it showed. I was idly wondering who would wear a summer dress to go fishing when Annie screamed. She caught a fish, and quite a large one, judging by the way the fishing rod was bent. I instantly found myself next to her, telling her what to do. Anita also came up, encouraging her. She caught crappy. I didn't even know there were crappy in my pond. Good size, great for eating. When I told her this, she immediately demanded that I leave her. I promised that I would leave it if she ate it. It seems that little Annie was a natural fisherman because she ended up catching nine of them, big enough to eat. I asked when she wanted to have a fish dinner. Tonight? Don't you need to go home? She looked sad again, and Anita hugged her. She might stay a little longer if you fry her fish. Those puppy dog eyes again, but this time there were two of them. Annie showed no disgust as I cleaned the fish by placing it in some lemon water while we prepared the side dishes. Anitha took this as an invitation to take over my kitchen and soon placed Annie on a chair to watch her prepare hash puppies and tartar sauce. I had to make coleslaw, so I fired up my gas grill and put some corn on it to grill, using the side burner to heat the oil. Annie watched as I dipped the fish in the milk and egg wash before dipping it in the seasoned flour. When it was time to fry, I told her to move away because of the hot oil. Anita let her set the picnic table and pour the tea while she removed the corn from the grill. It didn't take long for nine crappy to turn into golden brown pieces. I showed Annie how to avoid the bones. She ate like she was hungry, eating four crappy, an ear of corn and coleslaw. She also ate about six large hash puppies that I made. I wondered where she was putting all this. Anita sat her down on the sofa while I put away the fishing equipment. I sat on the porch swing, listening to her sing in the kitchen and watching the little angel sleep on my couch, and tears rolled down my cheeks. This was supposed to be my life, damn it, I felt someone tugging on my sleeve. Annie woke up and stood in front of me. Without thinking, I picked her up and sat her on my lap, rocking gently. She made herself comfortable and fell asleep again. I felt it, but didn't see it. Looking up, I saw her through the mosquito net. She was crying. Without saying a word, she turned and left. Ten minutes later, she returned with two cups of coffee, placed them on the side table, and sat on the swing, snuggling up to me and playing with Anita's hair. It was very nice. I enjoyed the moment before I spoke. Do you want to tell me what's going on here? Remember my sister Jen? This is her little girl. Her husband and she separated about seven years ago, right after Annie was born. Jen had a good job, so she stayed there, raising her little girl. Then her husband came back after all these years and wanted to make peace. She was engaged and laughed, 
saying that he would never be Annie's father because she already had a father waiting. He tried for weeks until she got a protective order. One night he got high, broke down the door and shot Jen and Tommy while Annie slept. She heard shots and stood up. Her father had already run away, so this precious girl had to call 911. Social services was about to pick her up when we intervened. Mom could not cope with caring for the little girl, so I filed a petition and received the status of her guardian. She's my little girl now, bud. I've been thinking about this for a while. When I found out that you stopped traveling, I had the perfect idea. She needs a dad, and I can't think of a better person to fill that spot. She already trusts you more than anyone I've seen her with since I took her. I could have been hit with a feather when she came here and climbed into your lap. You look so good together, naturally, you understand. So I'm asking, not just for myself, but for both of us. Become a part of our lives, share a little of your heart, at least with her. I know I can never get you back, but if I can be even a little involved in your life, it will make me very happy. Please, bud. I don't know exactly when my arm wrapped around her shoulders, but I hugged her as tightly as I could with the baby on my lap. At some point during the hug, we fell asleep. I woke up and saw Annie smiling. I need to go to the toilet. I woke Anita up and she took her to the bathroom. I looked at my watch, surprised that it was almost midnight. I bet it will wreak havoc on the little girl's sleep patterns. Anita came out of the bathroom, smiling. It's too late to go home. Annie in the bathroom. You have a huge bathtub. I need t-shirts instead of nightgowns, and you need to prepare the guest bedroom. She's very happy about the sleepover. I fluffed the pillows, made sure there were enough blankets, and made the bed. Annie came in, my t-shirt almost reaching her ankles, and demanded that I lay her down and tell her a story while she waited for Anita. You should kiss me goodnight, she mumbled sleepily, and I did. Anita walked in at that very moment, and her smile was huge. I felt like one of those catfish caught on a hook that I couldn't free myself from. Her t-shirt fit her much better, reaching only a few inches below her buttocks. I could see her nipples, and they seemed happy to see me. She might have shown off a little as she dove under the covers to snuggle up to Annie. I know she got a good night kiss. Where is mine? It was surprisingly sweet and tender, without any sexual overtones. She stroked my cheek when we finished. You are still the best man I have ever known, darling. Good night. I doubt I slept more than two hours that night thinking about the two angels in the guest bedroom. I have to admit, deep down in my soul, that I never let go of my love for Anita. Should I try again? All these thoughts swirled around in my head until I finally fell asleep. I woke up to an empty house, which was a little disappointing. Well, it's time to get back to reality. I was working in my garden when they returned. Annie jumped out of the car like a bullet and ran towards me. I barely managed to catch her when she jumped on me. We're here for the weekend. It's great, isn't it? What do we do? Mom says we can go to the zoo if I'm a good girl. I'll be a very good girl, I promise. What is this? What are you doing? I looked at Anita smiling. Well, can we stay? You're not playing fair. Her smile became even wider. I take that as a yes, and dear, in war and in love all means are fair, and this is not a war. I'll go unpack our bags. Do you want to come with me, Annie? No, Uncle Bud is going to teach me about gardens. Okay, sweetie, I would say don't get too dirty, but why? She turned, walking towards the house. I heard her hum quietly without taking even three steps. This was one of her signs, when she was happy, she would sing. Annie stayed with me for an hour, learning how to tie up tomatoes to keep the fruit off the ground. She went to the barn and brought back the basket I told her to bring, and I let her pick the squash, tomatoes, and corn, choosing only the ripest ones, saving the others for later. I saw a little green snake in the corn and showed it to her. She immediately wanted to hold it, but I said it was a wild animal and it probably wouldn't like being held. I let her carry the two turtles we found back to the pond. Turns out turtles love tomatoes, another reason I tied them up so they couldn't be eaten. She carried the basket back to the house, proudly showing Anita what she had collected. 
We washed up and Anita made us ham and cheese sandwiches with slices of tomatoes that Annie had picked. Then she took a bath with the bubble bath she had brought, dressed in fresh clothes, and told us that she was going to take a nap in her room, but that they would wake her if there was anything interesting. I wasn't sure what exactly was considered interesting for an eight-year-old girl, but I promised. Anita was cleaning the kitchen, so I went out onto the porch and sat on the swing. I liked to swing when I thought. When she finished, she joined me, rocking in silence. Perhaps twenty minutes passed before she spoke. I can't change what I did, bud. Many times I regretted that I couldn't. You meant my whole world, and you have no idea how I felt when I thought you were cheating. You were my whole world, and then you stopped being. She sighed, rocked a little more, and started again. I was stupid, bud, a stupid little girl, hurt and angry, and I chose the worst way to express it. I'm not a little girl anymore, honey. I'm a grown woman with a child to take care of. I have never forgotten you and will never forget. My child needs a father, and you are the best candidate. I need a husband, a strong, kind man who will help me cope with any problems and will love me for who I am. It's you, bud. You always have been. I just forgot. I know that you have forgiven me, but I know that you will never forget. There will always be a small part of you that wonders if I'll do it again. I can answer this question for you. Never. I'd rather kill myself. I'm not asking for a solution now, honey. I'm asking for a chance. If in the end you say no, I won't fight. I'll leave and won't bother you anymore. Don't say anything now unless you want to. Just think about it. I looked at her with a serious expression on my face. I saw the first signs of fear in her eyes. I have something to say. Well, ask anyway. What time do we need to leave for the zoo tomorrow? Her eyes widened, and then a smug smile appeared on her face that she couldn't hide. We need to leave early, dear. She's never been there, so she'll want to see everything. I'll pack us a picnic. The food will be mostly unhealthy. I don't know about you, but our daughter will grow up with her health in mind. What about dessert? Ice cream if you both behave. We need to go shopping when Annie wakes up. You barely have any food here. I was about to explain the bachelor's eating habits when Annie walked out, rubbing her eyes. She came straight to me and climbed onto my lap. I looked at Anita and the smug smile returned. What are we going to do now? We'll go get some groceries. We need to stock up if we're going to the zoo. You can stay here if you want. No, Uncle Bud is coming with us, isn't he? Well, I would put it to a vote, but I suspect I would lose so let's get some groceries. I was suddenly glad I bought this new SUV, thinking it would be a good family car. Anita sat down and sank into the leather seats. Very good, bud. You must be making a ton of money now. I suddenly realized that she had no idea how much I was worth. I had a very good salary by the standards of the time and area, but I was making four to six times more per year in the bait business. Oh, I can handle it. Annie, stop playing with the buttons. She raised and lowered the windows. Apparently she had never been in a car with power windows. She looked guilty for a moment, but giggled. Yes, sir, Uncle Bud. The trip to the store was quite educational. Usually I would just jump in, grab what I wanted, and be out fifteen minutes later. Annie tried to stuff every snack in the world into her cart, while Anita compared the quality and price of each item. After 30 minutes, I wanted to blow my head off. Again, she smiled smugly. You better get used to it, because sometimes it will be your task. Why should I go shopping? Because I'll either be in the hospital delivering our babies, or at home trying to recover. Well, it stopped me in the middle of the aisle. She just giggled and continued walking. I finally came to my senses and hurried after them. What did you say? We'll talk about this later, honey. Now, would fried turkey sandwiches be okay for tomorrow? I was outplayed again, but I scored a small victory by going back to the meat counter and buying tea bonds for dinner. Anita was grumbling about red meat until I said I wouldn't fry it for her. We could have salmon or something. We were already leaving when she looked at a large store next to the market. 
Suddenly, we were inside, choosing the right car seat for Annie. Does yours need to be replaced? The smug smile appeared again. How did I not notice this before? Mine is fine, honey. This is for your car. We will use it more often for family trips. It is newer and has more space. I was carrying the car seat to the checkout when Annie suddenly rushed to the side, and Anita hurried after her. She saw a swing and dreamed of the most expensive ones. Annie, honey, we can't afford this. Even if we could, we don't have a place to install it. She smiled, and I saw shadows of Anita's smug smile. Looks like she already taught her. Uncle Bud has a place at his house. We could install it there. We might even move in with him. How convenient is this? That smile looked like it could freeze on her face if she wasn't careful. Very convenient, dear. I might even buy it if he allowed it. But it's too early. We have to show him how much we love him before he even thinks about it. But you already love him. That's what you told me. And I love him too, I think. We could try. I picked her up, handing the car seat to Anita. You don't understand this, honey, but this is a grown-up thing. You'll understand when you grow up, I promise. For now, let's just say I'll look into the swing and see what happens. Fine. It was almost a promise, but not quite. She relaxed, and I had to carry her to the car. Anita held my hand on the way back. Am I pushing too hard? You're putting pressure on her, I said, looking at Annie in the mirror. There have already been a lot of changes in her life. Let's not complicate things. Fine. When you're ready, darling, when you're ready. We grilled steaks, corn and potatoes and ate outside again. Anita explained this to me. Where we live there aren't a lot of green spaces, so she doesn't get outside as often as she should. Let him enjoy it. That night, just after dark, I took them to the pond, set up a lantern, and cast out their fishing rods, sitting Annie on my lap. Fifteen minutes later she screamed when her fishing rod bent. I told her what to do, and she caught a nice catfish, probably about five pounds. She was disappointed when I sent him back, but I told her we'd come back later and catch enough to eat. She caught three and Anita caught two before we stopped. I caught more than you, she said as we walked back. They helped you, honey. Next time I will sit on his lap and he will help me. Nuo, sorry, mom. No need to apologize, honey. Just learn to be generous. Then it was time for bathing and sleep. I read her a fairy tale from the book that Anita brought, and she fell asleep within a few minutes. I went looking for Anita and found her in my bed. No sex, dear. I don't think you're ready, but I want to be there. I missed her almost as much as I missed love. Come to me. It felt strange to hug her again after all these years. I was so embarrassed that I wasn't even excited. She giggled and snuggled close to me, hugging my arms, falling asleep within a few minutes. I thought I was going to have another sleepless night when I felt someone pulling my nose. I woke up and saw Annie giggling. Mom said you should get up. Breakfast is ready and we need to leave soon. Hurry up. She was exhausted at the zoo trying to see everything at once. Once again, I carried the sleeping child to my car. We developed a habit. They arrived on Friday and left on Sunday. People are used to seeing us together around town, recognizing us as family. Zippy finally convinced us by inviting us to a barbecue. Annie had several children her age to play with while the adults interacted. He caught me alone and congratulated me on Anita's return. I felt sorry for her, you know. We all knew how hot her temper was. She made a big mistake, but I think she paid the price. Now, get off your ass and give it back. You both haven't been okay since the divorce. Mama Rose added, This child is very lucky to go from such tragic circumstances to a loving mother and father. Do the right thing for her too. Billy and June agreed. I thought about it for a couple of weeks and decided that the majority rules. Luck helped me. Anita usually left work early on Fridays, but an emergency happened and she called me in a panic to pick Annie up from kindergarten. Annie threw herself around my neck, chatting and trying to show me off to everyone. I barely managed to get her into her car seat to go home. 
I took advantage of the trip to have a serious conversation with her. Her eyes widened and she began to cry. I was scared, thinking that I had misunderstood her, but she was crying with happiness. By the time her mother returned home, she was already calm, although she was still ready to burst with joy. Mom, come take a look. She dragged her into the backyard, where Anita saw a swing even larger than the one in the store. Look, there is a swing, a house, a slide, everything. Do you like it? Very sweet, honey, and it's not even your birthday. Annie expertly feigned sadness before looking up and showing a real smile. This time I was glad I wasn't in her place enjoying the show. Mom, Dad said there is a condition. I can't have this swing unless I live here. And since I can't live here without you, you should live here too. Now, Dad said this might help you make a decision. She handed her a beautifully packaged box. From where I was hiding, I saw tears in her eyes. Her hands shook as she unwrapped the box and opened it. She screamed when she saw the ring and sat down on the swing. Annie was spinning around, so excited. Well, will you agree? Dad said we should live here forever, and I would have younger brothers or sisters. I will teach them how to fish, what to do in the garden, and everything about kindergarten and school. This will be so much fun. Well, I came out from behind the tree. She saw me, smiling through her tears. Then she stood up, and her smug smile returned. I'll think about it, honey. Well, she thought. Thirty-six years later, three children, seven grandchildren, and two more on the way, and the verdict is still pending. One thing we've learned is not to panic if we don't know where the other is. Anita was so worried that I threatened to take her phone away. I either trust you or I don't. I decided that I trust, so enough with these calls. I don't mother full-time I work. So do what you need to do and stop worrying before you drive us all crazy. Yes, she finally found out how much I was worth and quit her job the next day, throwing away her birth control pills. She spent the next two decades taking children everywhere until they all left the nest. And then we started traveling, but not around Buffalo. We went on cruises, visited warm and exotic places, and cold and exotic places. Finally satisfied, we settled down for a quiet life. We have joined a group that helps children at risk and provide temporary homes for children from newborns to late teens, sometimes for several months. More than one of them received scholarships to attend a local college or vocational school. The smartest of them continued their studies and received higher education. Everything changed when I came home one day and saw Anita looking worried. I saw a small head with black curls peeking out from behind her back. She finally persuaded the girl to come out, holding her to calm her down. She was four years old and was severely beaten. The scars will last a lifetime. I looked at her, imagining dance recitals, driving lessons, sporting events, and dates in the future. Yes, I said, that was the whole conversation. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.